Okay, thanks. All right, everyone, what's up? All right. All right, hello, everybody. I'm Rolando, uh, one of the new uh, IP staff here, joining September for the ones who haven't met me. Um, I'm going to be talking about bronchoscopic <laughs> management of COPD. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster since we're running behind, so no disclosures there. So, uh, first of all, the objective of this talk is to determine which patient is a candidate for lung volume reduction surgery and bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. That's one of the objectives. The way we accomplish that one is to define the clinical problem and what we compare ourselves to. Okay, so once we have a standard, then we can figure out where to go from there. Uh, number two is review and understand the indications and contraindications for uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, uh, describing what has been done and the evidence behind each of those options. And then finally, hopefully, through the lecture, we'll stimulate some learning and research ideas in the, in the division, okay? And I'll give you my thoughts on what, what I question about all these techniques and where do I think we should go from, okay? So, uh, Stay in front of the microphone. okay, can everybody hear me? All right, so first of all, if we're going to talk about a problem, we have to define it. So this is very simple. This is GINA guidelines. Basically, COPD is a common, preventable, and treatable disease characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation due to uh, airway and or uh, alveolar abnormalities and usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. So that's what we're dealing with. Now, the problem is how prevalent is this? So what you have right there is a map of, uh, this is 2016 by CDC on uh, smoking in the U.S. So as you can tell, Michigan uh, is you know, right there, and we're somewhere about 18 to 22 percent uh, prevalence of cigarette smoking. And if you mirror these things with the prevalence of COPD, it looks very similar, right? Makes sense. So somewhere about 7.6 to 12 um, percent. Now this also is going to mirror, uh, oh, I should also say that the global prevalence of COPD, even though it's decreasing in the U.S., across the world is going up. So it's expected to rise over the next 30 years. And then you know, the mortality, that's the problem, right? So we have age standardized death rates for COPD. The green one is overall uh, men here, uh, women here. So fortunately, men has decreased. Unfortunately, men, uh, women have become sort of stagnant on mortality. Um, and that's what's led to uh, not very significant improvements in mortality. Um, as far as mortality specific for Michigan, right there, we're somewhere halfway uh, for the U.S. So that is the problem. And then mortality global, fourth leading cause of death worldwide, and it'll become the third by 2020, which is pretty high. More than 3 million deaths than, uh, due to COPD in 2012, and predicted 4.5 million by 2030. So globally, what I'm trying to say is that glo the, the burden of COPD is going up. That's basically what, what I'm trying to say here. So aside from the mortality and morbidity and everything, this is related to health care costs, of course. So smoking-related illnesses in the U.S. cost more than $300 billion each year. And, you know, we spend a lot of money, basically, on COPD. How do we manage COPD? What we have so far are just a bunch of inhalers in addition to other things. Uh, this is just uh, GINA guidelines. So all that is, you know, honky-dory, all that works fine. Then my question to you and the reason for this talk is, how do you plan to help this patient? You know, I, I bet adding Spareva or anything else for that patient is not going to do a whole lot. So that's what we're dealing with here. So that is a patient um, previously. So the question, uh, and I want to start with a, you know, a question that I think is potential for your boards. So it's a 69-year-old man, has COPD, presents to your clinic to establish care. 60-packer history of smoking, quit 18 years ago. Has mild distant exertion and chronic productive cough several years. One exacerbation over the last two years. He takes Lama Lava uh, and is up to date with vaccines. Spirometry shows obstructive defect, FAV1 40%, and no bronchodilator response, and the LCO is 40%. No hypoxia. Chest CT from two years ago has bilateral diffuse emphysema. So, which of the following is the best next step? You got a bunch of options there. So, number one will be referred to an IP for consideration of bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And since this is the talk, that may be the answer, or may not. Uh, lung cancer screening program for low dose CT pulmonary rehab program, thoracic surgery for lumbar reduction surgery, or start reflumalized. I got C and someone said A. All right, we'll just move on. What I think the right answer here is refer to pulmonary rehabilitation program. 
the point that I'm trying to make with this question is that in pulmonary boards, I think bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery or bronchoscopic lung volume reduction is going to be the wrong choice, okay? Because there's very little proven things regarding that, okay? So, again, evidence level A for pulmonary rehabilitation program. So that's probably the right answer there. Now, no lung cancer screening, uh, low dose CT because he quit 18 years ago. Right. So, thoracic surgery for lung bone reduction surgery is the wrong answer because there's bilateral diffuse emphysema. And we go through those things. Start reforming that doesn't meet criteria based on that. So, let's talk about lung bone reduction. So, this, I think... The intended physiologic effects of lung bone reduction is to increase elastic recall, dynamic compliance, decrease air trapping, diaphragm distension, uh, and decrease ventilation profusion mismatch, mismatch. And hopefully, by doing those things, you improve pulmonary function tests, exercise capacity, quality of life, and more importantly, survival. That's what we we're trying to do, you know, accomplish. And I, I think lung bone reduction surgery has been present for over two decades now. Uh, but the, the landmark study, uh, the NETT, National um, Emphysema Treatment Trial, came out in 2003. So it was a randomized control trial, multi-center, uh, multiple institutions, several patients. 3,200 were um, evaluated, but out of those, only 37% were uh, enrolled. And the reason for that is they were very stringent with their inclusion and particularly exclusion criteria. And I personally think that this is, this is good for studies, okay, but it's might not be very good for clinical applications, okay? When you start putting this many exclusion criteria into a study, then how are you going to be able to replicate this in, in clinical practice? <coughs> it's very difficult, right? So out of those 3,200, only 37% underwent uh, randomization, half of them to surgery, half of them to medical therapy. And then we measured uh, some outcomes. Uh, others in, uh, other inclusions, um, air trapping, hyperinflation, cardiac clearance, pre-rehab, this was important. Uh, the numbers are pre-rehab, so FEV1 less than 45%, um, and then they must complete a 6 to 10 week uh, pulmonary rehabilitation program. So what about the results? The primary <coughs> outcome was mortality and exercise capacity at two years. Those are the main things that we're looking at. And then a bunch of other secondary outcomes. So the results. Number one is there is an increased exercise capacity and quality of life for lung volume reduction surgery compared to medical therapy but there's no survival benefit overall. So that is this graphic at top here. So all patients, basically after the 60 months of follow-up, the, the, the survival was the same. Now when they, when they started doing you know, post-hoc analysis and everything, they realized that there's a subgroup of patients that has improved survival. And that's where the indication for lung volume reduction surgery comes, okay? So that's this group here, all right? So upper low predominant of emphysema, and low baseline uh, exercise capacity. All right, so those are the patients that are going to benefit from lung bone reduction surgery as far as mortality goes. The downside to all that are the complications. Yeah. You know, sometimes we're concerned about you know, pneumothorax in a patient from a CT guided biopsy, 15-20% or from a transplant guided biopsy, but the rate of pneumothorax for this patient is 100%. Okay? So we have to keep that in mind. 58% had at least one complication 90% had a prolonged air leak, okay, and 90, at the 90 day survival, uh, mortality, I'm sorry, was 7.9% versus 1.3 for medical therapy. So it looks like it works for a subset group of, for a subgroup of patients, but there's increased, increased rate of complications and, and mortality. And Dr. Walton, those complications are for that subgroup or for the whole? For the whole. Okay. Okay. So, in summary, when I try to compile all this information and, and, and try to digest it, who should be considered for lung volume reduction surgery? Who should not be considered, I'm sorry, the higher risk patients. So FEV1s less than 20%, DLCO2 less than 20%, and homogeneous emphysema because there's very little benefit to those patients. The other ones that maybe should be considered, FEV1 less than 35, again it has to be more than 20, hyperinflation, upper low predominant emphysema, no CO2 retention and low exercise capacity. So this is the patient that we're thinking about lung volume reduction surgery. Now the thing is, we know what the clinical problem is, and we know which, which patient is a candidate for lung bone reduction surgery. Now we've got to figure out, is there a better way to do this? You know, can we replicate the benefits of this without the problems? That's what we're trying to accomplish. And finally, can we figure out a phenotype of patient that will benefit 
from long bone reduction surgery, from bronchoscopic long bone reduction. Okay? That's what we're trying to accomplish. So multiple options. Now we're going to jump into techniques, okay? So this is a this is a, sort of a summary of what we have available. These two up here are endobronchial valves. They call this endobronchial EBV, and then they call this intrabronchial valve. But the physiology behind them is very similar. It's the same, basically. It's a one-way valve that allows air to go uh, only one direction. Okay? Now, what you have right here, uh, let's go with this one, bypass or exhale system. Basically, what you're trying to do, and I have some more slides later on, is to, for lack of a better way to say it, poke a hole through the, through the bronchus and put a stent inside. That way you open up the airway to areas that are emphysematous. Okay? Where air is being trapped. Vapor and sealants try to do the same thing, but by, via a different mechanism. So here you have a sealant. What you're doing is instilling a substance that causes inflammation and fibrosis, and eventually that part of the, the lung will collapse. Okay? Same thing with vapor. It's just thermal. And then LVRC stands for lung volume reduction coils. Uh, tries to do uh, basically contracture of the airways. <coughs> so these are all the techniques that have been studied and we'll go briefly through through those. So to start with a question and we'll we'll at the end of this hopefully we can pick the right answer or know why one is the right answer. So COPD patient referred to you to discuss treatment options for emphysema. He has progressive dyspnea over the last five years despite optical medical optimal medical therapy. Uh, and he already completed a rehabilitation program. So PFTs, uh, FEV1 35, ELCO 35, chest CT shows bilateral diffuse emphysema. So which one of the following is true regarding bronchoscopic lung volume reduction? And this is kind of tough. But bronchoscopic has survival benefit compared to medical therapy. It's contraindication, contraindicated in patients with homogeneous emphysema. Endobronchial valves should be considered in patients without collateral ventilation and lung volume reduction coils are contraindicated in the presence of collateral ventilation. B. B. All right. So what I believe to be the right answer is that one, C. Okay? And hopefully by the end of this we'll figure out why. Okay? <laughs> The kicker is this one, without collateral ventilation, okay? So, um, over over a decade ago, the idea of uh, the endobronchial valves came, uh, and one of the first trials, I think, was the VENT trial. Uh, this one tested the intrabronchial valves, the one that I showed you at the beginning. So that one, the spiration valve. Um, it was a randomized uh, control trial, but it had no sham, okay? So 321 patients. And what they did um, is they treated one lobe with valves versus a standard medical therapy. That's what they did. Okay? The results, they tested FEV1, uh, which improved by 4.3% only, and 6-minute walk is only by 2.5%. So really not a significant improvement of the numbers. But whenever they analyzed it further, they saw that there was more improvement in FEV1 with intact fissures. So that's where the whole idea of collateral ventilation came through. All right? So major complications was the problem of that study. You know, significant rates of complications as far as acute exacerbation of COPD, hemoptysis, and pneumonia in the target lobe even several months afterwards. So based on this, uh, the FDA reviewed this uh, trial and recommended against the approval of these things for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Okay? This uh, valves have approval under a humanitarian device uh, for uh, prolonged air leaks. So they grabbed this idea that these things seem to work whenever you have intact, intact fissures. So they, they came up with this study. I think this is that of the Everhart group. Um, partial bilateral versus complete unilateral occlusion. So what they're trying to figure out is, if I block the whole lobe, is there an improvement? That, that's what they're trying to figure out. And then they measured the same things, right? PFT, six-minute walk test, and everything. And everything was improved in the complete unilateral group compared to the other one, all right? The FEV1 particularly was 21% uh, improved. Okay. Complications? Some. So based on this, what we're saying is collateral ventilation prevents complete lower collapse 
and this is what reduces the improvement or the effect. Okay. So what do we? How do we assess collateral ventilation? All right. There are two ways that are used. Number one is we can ask radiologists to help us in this sense and figure out if the fissures are completely seen or not. That's one way. Then the other way is the other way, and I haven't used this uh, this particular system. Um, but what you do is you bring a bronchoscope to the intended lower area and then inflate a balloon that blocks flow. And at the same time, the same catheter measures if there is flow coming back towards you. So if you're blocking a segment of the lung, okay, a, a, a lobe, and you're still uh, sensing um, yeah, ventilation going towards you, then you assume that there's collateral ventilation there. If you inflate, and by the same token, there's nothing going back to you, and you see a decrease of the flow, then you assume that there's no collateral ventilation. So based on this, there are some studies that have done that. Okay? They've taken the patient, same patient population, but they've assessed collateral ventilation, and then uh, they've measured the results. This is one of the first trials that did that. They used, sorry, I'm going backwards, this particular system for that one. Okay? Randomized control trial, again, crossover at six months, uh, severe emphysema and no collateral ventilation. And then they tested, obviously, endobronchial valves versus standard of care. And the results were positive in that sense. So what we have here is uh, the improvement of uh, FAV1, force vital capacity, and 6 middle walk test. And as you can tell, some of those did hit the minimum clinically significant uh, levels. So that sounds all good. The results, by the way, were preserved up to one year. So based on that, uh, endobronchial valves significantly improved pulmonary function and exercise capacity in patients that have severe emphysema and abscess of collateral ventilation. Okay. The problem with all that yeah, this is complications. Same thing again. So 23 serious adverse events in the treatment group <coughs> versus 5 in the control group. CVAs, pneumothoraces, 18%. And 22% needed the valves to be taken out. 17% needed the valves replaced up to one year. So if, if we place these valves in patients, it seems like we're going to be following them and you know having to take care of these complications later on. But overall, physiology and quality of life does improve. This is a very similar trial. They basically tested the same thing, uh, and they had very similar results. So FEV1 improved, uh, and the other parameters also improved. The same thing, complications. This is a recurring uh, theme and, and, uh, with all these procedures. So pneumothorax, you know, uh, pneumonias, things like that. So the conclusions of these studies are that you know, for patients with severe emphysema and no collateral ventilation, you do get some improvement in lung function, dyspnea, and quality of life. The results of this particular study, the transfer, uh, transform trial, are pending for a two-year follow-up. They should be coming up in probably 2019. This is 2017. So in summary, about the valves specifically, patient phenotyping and selection is critical because collateral ventilation determines the treatment response. So we need to uh, assess that. The benefits, we're already using some of these devices for other things, uh, particularly for persistent air leaks. And these are the devices that have the most experience out of all of them, okay? Uh, and they're removable, and we'll see why that is relevant. The drawbacks, there's no survival benefit seen so far, and adverse events rate. So this is uh, ongoing trials that um, I scanned through. Uh, these are basically testing the same things. There's nothing really uh, altering about these trials. They're basically doing the same things. But their results, you know, 2020 probably. Another option are lung volume reduction coils. This picture doesn't look too, too good, but basically, this is a coil uh, made out of nitinol, right? Nitinol. Um, and then it acquires this shape once it's delivered inside. And by doing that, you collapse a segment of the lung, okay? Patients on the trials usually have about 10 to 14 percent, uh, 10 to 14 of these coils placed in order to retract the area of the lung. So one of the first trials, um, the renewed trial, prospective, Randomized control trials basically tested lung volume reduction coils versus standard of care medical therapy, and they tested the same thing, six minute walk test uh, differences. And they were really that encouraging. So uh, the change in the six minute walk test was 10 meters for the coils and negative seven for medical therapy. So there wasn't a really significant change there. Um, 
So as you can tell here, 10.3 versus 7.6. And on top of that, there were major complications. 34% for the coals uh, versus 19%. Pneumonia, acute exacerbation of COPD, pneumothorax, hemoptysis, and such. So modest improvement in six minute walk test, if anything, and probably uh, no significance for that with risk of complications. Same thing, this was a different study that basically found the same things. So in summary, selection remains critical, maybe an option in patients with collateral ventilation, and that's particularly the important thing about coils in comparison to valves. But it's a permanent foreign body, infection risk has been brought up, uh, and I'll show something that someone's uh, doing some research on, and the adverse events. So I, I thought this was really interesting, it's just an observational study, but what they're doing is they're, they're testing the microbiome, the, the change of the microbiome in the, lung, in the lungs of patients with uh, coils uh, placed. Uh, this is coming out of the group in Germany, which is the one that has the most experience with this. Again, very briefly on uh, biological bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Basically, a biodegradable hydrogel thrombin and fibrinogen, you instill it, inflammatory response causes con contraction of that uh, segment of the lung. Uh, this is one of the initial studies on this, uh, 25 patients, heterogeneous emphysema. The, num the pulmonary function test did improve, uh, but there was again increased risk of exacerbations of COPD. Um, because of all this data, uh, the use of biological sequence has sort of been abandoned now. Abandoned now. Bronchoscopic uh, vapor thermal ablation, similar concept. Uh, this was again a multi-center uh, uh, open label study. They did have improvement in FEV1 and uh, quality of life and dyspnea scores. Uh, and a significant reduction in lower volume, but again, adverse events. So what they're doing is basically they're instilling uh, the uh, vapor into a segment of the lobe, the lung, and therefore decreasing the, the size of it. The thing is a subsequent analysis, uh, subsequent analysis suggests procedure effectiveness, reduction in the lower volume, independent of collateral ventilation. So if you have collateral ventilation and you're thinking about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery, probably coils and bronchoscopic uh, thermal ablation are a better option because they're not dependent on the absence of collateral ventilation. Bypass stents, um, I mentioned this earlier, taking the bronchoscope to that segment of the uh, bronchus, passing a needle, uh, has some radiofrequency ablation, uh, creates a bigger hole, then you put a balloon, <coughs> dilate that, and eventually put a stent inside of it. And, and this is, I thought it was a really interesting video, that right there, is a stent inside uh, of the airways. And as you can see, there's uh, dilated airways behind that. Their use has now been abandoned due to lack of noticeable benefit. So there was um, no significant improvement in FEV1 and some of the other things. They clicked them. Yeah. They, when they originally placed them, originally placed them, they tried it with, um, without anything, then they tried it with paclitaxel, but patients symptomatically improved and then rapidly um, reverted and like 80% of them would um, granulate over. All right, so those are bypass stents. If you want to have a good review on all these techniques, probably this is the best paper that I found. Um, it's a Cochrane review again. Uh, Airy seal, the sealant that I mentioned has been abandoned because of complications. Same thing for the stents. The ones that have the most uh, depth of uh, literature, uh, data behind them are the valves, as I mentioned. There's significant improvement in FEV1, uh, although there's no difference in mortality and there's an increased complication rate. Uh, but remember that absence of collateral ventilation is important for these things. Overall, when they compiled all this information, there was no significant uh, improvement in mortality and adverse events was higher. Now, I was thinking about, you know, you know, is it worth it to put one of those valves? And then in this study, this was another systematic review, what they did is they compared medical management versus lung volume reduction surgery in the non-high-risk group, so the data from the, non, uh, from the national emphysema treatment trial, uh, versus uh, valves and coils. And basically, uh, the change in FEV1 seems significant for uh, the valves, but not for the coils. Uh, Six-minute walk test and uh, uh, quality of life did, did improve. So valves, improvement in FEV1, six-minute walk test, uh, quality of life with intact fissures. 
Lumbar reduction calls, maybe an improvement in the FV1, that's kind of questionable, but it does improve 6 minute walk test and um, quality of life. And 90 day mortality, if you compare it across all of those, lung volume reduction surgery in the non high risk group, non high risk group, 5.2. Uh, Medical management from the NETT trial, 1.5. And overall, the mortality for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction seems to be somewhere about 0 to 2.3. So overall, it's still better. Summary, we'll skip that. So overall, uh, putting this question back there, <coughs> bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery has survival benefit compared to medical therapy? Wrong. Contraindication, uh, contraindicated patients with homogeneous emphysema? That's wrong because you can try coils or uh, vapor, vapor thermal, thermal ablation. Um, and then coils are contraindication in the, contraindicated in the presence of clara ventilation. That's also wrong. Okay. So, summary. <clears throat> bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery, I'm sorry, uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction versus medical therapy appears to be better as far as pulmonary function tests, uh, functional and quality of life, but it has a higher adverse event rate. Safety profile appears acceptable for valves. That's what we have the most information for. Versus lung volume reduction surgery, it seems comparable as far as PFTs, functional and quality of life, and it has a safer profile. You compare those two but there is no survival benefit, okay? So, uh, finally, careful selection is important. We've talked about collateral, ventil collateral ventilation and other techniques that may, uh, that have fallen out of favor. Uh, we need more long-term data. So finally, these are the questions that I have <clears throat> when I was putting this talk together, is why do we see improvement in physiology and functional parameters, but not improvement in, in survival? Are we intervening too late? Should we consider bronchoscopic lung volume reduction surgery in moderate emphysema and not wait until it's severe? Phenotype in patients which will advance to severe emphysema and intervene earlier might be more interesting or valuable for us. And should we focus more on comorbidities? You know, have we reached the maximum that we can do as far as mortality goes? Should we consider bronchoscopic lung volume reduction in higher risk patients? So someone with a DLC of 20% has more likelihood of benefiting from one of these procedures than someone who doesn't. But again, an adverse event, pneumothorax in this patient could be catastrophic, right? So we need more data. I think that's it. Questions?
was trying to come back. The idea of the Chartist system um, was that could we isolate out? Um, we were doing research here. I, I, we had built something to do end state. Uh, we were looking at segmental dead space analysis. It's the same concept to see if you could cherry pick which lobes you were going to block off to maximize the effectiveness. That's the idea behind Chartist. Most of the studies are low bar, though, because um, everybody wants you to anatomically link it. But they were trying to see if we could identify other areas with collateral flow. That's what the whole idea with the Chartist system is. Um, I don't know where it's really going to go. The study, um, the study kind of ran into um, a few speed bumps, but um, through my colleagues in Europe and Australia, they, they use the valves routinely, and they are um, they have a lot of success. They have a lot of success with helping stabilize out the, um, their patient populations with that with end-stage COPD. And as was mentioned, it's it's becoming more and more of a problem everywhere. And then the last little um, sideline is that. It was with the M, the Zephyr valve that we actually published. I was one of the authors that published the use of it um, for uh, prolonged air leaks. We, a bunch of us just independently, we did some, then somebody else did some, somebody else did some, the whole group put their paper, and the um, paper was published, and the FDA looked at it and said, yeah, no, this is good data. But the problem was Spiration, the other company, actually was the ones who took that in for, um, took the data from the other company, um, work and took it to the FDA and got their valve authorized. So it's actually the other company's valve that never finished the study in the United States. That is the only one that's able to be used in the United States for um, for airway by I mean for um, prolonged air release. You had a question. Um, one of your last questions at the end of the lecture: Are we offering it too late, or at the same time, I think to offer to somebody who's not a candidate for surgery? At the end, placing valves, from what we experience in the Bronx suite, is a long procedure. Mm -hmm. So they, they go to the OR, yeah. and they are then sick at the, at the late stage of their disease. Uh, is, the, is the complication is, is higher, but they, but they did not transfer into like longer need for mechanical ventilation or around the time of procedure? So let me. Thinking if, if I if I take that sick late stage COPD patient and expose mm -hmm. him to an OR elective. Mm -hmm. So I so first of all the the patients that you've seen here uh, that we have in the uh, Bronx suite and then we take to the to the OR for a valve placement that's a slightly different patient population. They may have similar comorbidities, but it's not the same patient that we're selecting for long volume reduction. Uh, those are the patients with with persistent air leaks. Uh, for one or other reason, whether that's a segmentectomy, a wedge, or a pneumonectomy, or long bone reduction surgery, regardless of the reason, it's a post-surgical persistent air leak, what we're taking. And that is what we've referred, uh, we've said that has the humanitarian device approval for placement. Now, if you correct me if I'm understanding your question, uh, fine. Uh, it's, your question is, if we're choosing a sicker patient with more advanced COPD to do a procedure, would that be beneficial? Exactly. Taking into consideration and, and, and that's exactly why I have it there as a question, because it hasn't been studied. So my, my, my question is, if you have someone who has a DLCO of 15%, okay, giving them uh, some improvement might be a lot more beneficial than someone who has a an, an DLCO of 35%. That is my whole point. So I don't know if we're intervening too late on those patients, or if we're not intervening on patients that may benefit from it. Taken, uh, taken into consideration how catastrophic and adverse events might be in those patients. So, I don't know if I answer your question, yeah. I try my best. Anything else? All right, thank you. <laughs>